pleased to be here once again at the Skirball Cultural Center. Uh, for those of you who are visitors and are not familiar with Plato, we are a group of 400 intellectually uh, curious people who get together and meet in a variety of forums on, in, in or near Westwood Village, such as, such as this one. Uh, we have study discussion groups where small groups of 14 to 15 people get together for a period of 14 weeks to discuss uh, a variety of subjects. If you should be interested in learning more about Plato, we have a table out in front where you can get more information and there are people there available to uh, talk to you more about the Plato Society and uh, hopefully that will pique your interest. Um, we've got a wonderful speaker uh, this afternoon on a very interesting topic and he will be introduced by Jay Rakow, who is uh, the chairman of our um, colloquium program. Jay? Thank you, Fred, and thank you all for coming. By the way, we do have a photographer circulating around, so uh, just to let people know, it'll be very unobtrusive, but uh, you might find yourself um, in a photo somewhere. Um, today, we were thrilled to have a towering figure in healthcare economics with us today. Uh, professor Thomas Rice is, uh, is actually a distinguished professor of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. He's a former vice chancellor of academic personnel for the UCLA campus, and he teaches courses in health economics, research methodology, and current issues in health policy. Uh, he received a PhD in economics from Berkeley, and he's so smart he got in without bribing anyone. Um, he has conducted research and published numerous books and articles uh, on subjects uh, such as physicians' economic behavior, Medicare, healthcare cost containment, and the role of competition in healthcare. He's testified many times before the US Congress on many health policy issues, and he's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so uh, his list of publications is too long to read, uh, and we're very fortunate to have him talk about a subject that's in the news a lot, often with lots of opinions, but very few facts, and so today, He's going to enlighten us on what healthcare systems are like in other countries, how they compare to ours, and get some basic understanding of how these systems work. So I'd like to invite uh, Professor Rice to come on up. Um, Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be invited to be here, talk um, with you about other countries' healthcare systems and comparing it to the uh, U.S. So I think I'll just get straight into it. Um, I want to make four overarching points, and then I'll kind of whiz through a lot of the other slides, but I'll spend a little bit of time on this one. These are just some conclusions I've made so far in the work that I've done. The first overarching point is this, that to me there's no clear best country in terms of health care policy, nor is there even necessarily a best system and really not, probably not anything close to it. Um, just to give you some examples of this, like one uh, set of results I'll be talking with you uh, about today is from a U.S. foundation called the Commonwealth Fund. They survey people in 11 different countries, random survey every year about their experiences in the health care system. They collect data 
data on um, outcomes in the systems. And in their last survey of 11 countries, well, you can guess which country came in last. But um, in terms of ninth and tenth of the 11 countries, France came in ninth, Canada came in tenth. Well, France was touted as the best healthcare system in the world by the World Health Organization. Canada is the country that many people in the U.S. look to as a way in which we can reform, reform health care. Uh, the country that came in number one was the UK, but as I'll show you at the very end, there are five different sets of criteria. One criteria is outcomes. The UK came in tenth in outcomes, so is it really the best health care system? Um, the US looks pretty bad on a lot of things, but we look the best in certain things. For example, preventive care and curative care for cancer. So it's hard to pick out like one country that's best. It's also very hard to pick out a system that's best. For example, um, I can't think of two systems more different than the UK and the Netherlands. The UK is this top-down government system. The Netherlands is kind of just like us, but maybe on steroids. It's competing private insurers. Both of these countries are really good at keeping their populations happy. So it's hard to pick out a system type two. My second overarching point is even if you found a country you liked or you found a system you like, you can't just take it and plop it down here. We're different cultures, uh, di people want different things, but most importantly, they're very different political systems. And something that works in another country may not work very well here. So I have a thought experiment for you, a very brief one. So all countries have lower hospital prices, lower drug prices, lower physician prices in the United States. Let's say you find your country of choice and you take the system, you plop it down here. Are we going to be able to have those low prices here as they have in the other countries? My guess is probably not because these other countries, because the political power and the way political system works in the U.S. probably is not going to prevent us from enacting prices that lower. You just can't take another country's system and plop it down here. Uh, my third overarching point um, is that a lot of people don't like to hear this. Is incrementalism is the norm. Rarely do you see fundamental change in health care. We saw it 70 years ago in England when they adopted the National Health Service in, uh, after World War II. We kind of saw it in the Netherlands in 2006 when they went to a two-tier system of private insurance for the wealthier and public insurance for others and moved to a system of universal coverage where everyone had the same benefits. But this fundamental reform happened 20 years after the government came out with a report recommending this reform. It takes a long time. People often point to Canada and say, well, Canada just went and enacted uh, single payer. Well, not really. It took, a, it took 10 years and it was done province by province. These things take a while. You might point to the U.S. and say, well, we've done fundamental reform in the U.S. Look at Medicare, Medicaid, look at the ACA. Well, to me, those were not fundamental reforms. What they were is tremendous improvements in access to care, but they really didn't do much to change the health care system. So I think that incrementalism is what you really find in most places. And my final overarching point is that so you look at internet uh, cross-national statistics, you see we have such low life expectancy, we have such high infant mortality compared to other countries. What does that mean? It's the fault of our healthcare system. Well, undoubtedly it's partly, but it's probably also due to other differences in uh, between us and other countries. Um, give you an example. So Massachusetts has an infant mortality rate pretty similar to much of Western Europe. It's half the size of Mississippi. So you say, well, what is, what is it about Massachusetts that's different about Mississippi? Well, part of it is they probably have a pretty good health care system, but the other part of it is that Massachusettsans are different than Mississippians. And it's very hard for researchers to ferret out how much of the outcomes are due to population differences and how much are due to uh, health care systems. So what I'm going to be doing at the end is showing you indicators that I feel pretty confident are caused by the healthcare system because that's a better way to, you know, look at performance. Now, just to illustrate this last point, oops, here we go. So here's a, a slide of obesity rates across a number of countries. So you can see that uh, Japan has an obesity rate of one-ninth of the U.S. Japan also has the longest life expectancy in the world. Is it due to the Japanese healthcare system? Well, they have a good healthcare system. 
it has its problems, it's a good system though, but is it really responsible for the fact they live longer? Maybe it's more stuff like this that's responsible for that. So I think we have to be very careful in looking at bad outcomes and saying it's the fault of our healthcare system. I think it depends on which outcomes you're looking at and that's what we'll be trying to get at a little bit later. So I'm going to be talking about three things uh, today, uh, comparing the U.S. to other countries, some charts you may have even seen. Then I'm going to put you through uh, a certain amount of pain. I'm going to talk about nine countries' healthcare systems, but the good news is it's only two slides about each, and um, that's it make, it make it a little bit easier on both of us. I should say out front, um, I feel expert about the U.S. healthcare system. I am learning about other countries' healthcare systems. I do not feel expert. I'm working on a book over the next year, uh, so but I can give you at least my, my tentative uh, conclusions about them. And then um, I'm going to talk to you uh, briefly about a study I'm doing now to figure out which healthcare systems promote health equity. Ultimately, I'm interested in which healthcare system characteristics improve value as well as equity, but this study is just equity. So let's start with the national comparisons. I'll look at expenditures, coverage and access and outcomes and quality. Only one expenditure slide, it's this one. So this is uh, U.S. expenditures compared to other countries over a 35 year period. I mean, there's not much to say about it. I mean, the U.S. Uh, is a clear outlier. And it's not just because we're richer. When you control for income, we look just as much of an outlier and when you control for income as we do right, uh, right here. The other ones are pretty much in the middle of the pack. In fact, if you were to control for income for the other countries, they would all be on the same line. Pretty much how rich a country is determines how much it spends on health care, except in the U.S. We spend more than you would expect just big, given how wealthy we are. With regard to access, um, here are um, uh, nine countries, and this is percentage of population covered under public programs. You can see only two countries are not 100%. Germany, 11% of the population has private insurance, which I'll talk about later. In the U.S. is about 35%. That's basically the Medicare and the Medicaid population. What you're really interested in, though, is how many people are uninsured? And the answer in these other eight countries is pretty much no one is uninsured if they are are illegal residents. Okay? In the U.S., 10% are uninsured, which is way down from the 16% uh, before the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is a little bit busier slide. This is from the Com Commonwealth Fund survey of uh, not the population as a whole, but people with chronic diseases, sicker adults. And it looks at four different types of, uh, three different types of cost-related access problems. Did costs prevent you from filling a prescription, not going to a doctor, skipping a test, or any of these? And you can see access is more problematic in the U.S. than any country. The bottom right, 42% of Americans claim in the last year, cost was an impediment in, in any one of these three areas. Other countries, um, Australia also didn't do so well, do so well uh, here as well, but access, biggest problem in the U.S. Now, sometimes you hear, yeah, you know, um, we've got our problems here, but at least you can get care quickly. And it turns out it's way more nuanced than that. So what this slide looks at is how quickly can you get primary care. So it looks at access to uh, doctors and nurses when you're sick. And on the left, uh, a high bar is good, same or next day. You can see the U.S. is actually in these countries, or 11 countries, uh, you know, lower than half, uh, in, the in the bottom half in terms of being able to get something the next, next day. Uh, waited six or more days. The U.S., not so good. Countries that did really well, Switzerland and the U.K. did very well in this regard. So that's more primary care. What about specialty care and surgery? Well, here the U.S. does look better. Um, if you look at just the second and the fourth rows of data, uh, special appointment waiting more than two months, elective surgery waiting more than four months. Look at the U.S. number of 9%. Uh, we do pretty well. We're not the best. Switzerland's lower, Germany's lower, but we do pretty well. Uh, if you look at elective surgery four more months, we do pretty well. We're tied with Switzerland, not as good as Netherlands and Germany. I like this 0% number for Germany as a way to just get across the idea is you can have universal coverage without weights, and that's what they've demonstrated in Germany. On the, end of the other end of the spectrum, Canada looks really bad. If you look at the specialist appointment, 41% of Canadians said that they had to wait two or more months. That's mu it's higher than any other country 
Norway second. If you look at elective surgery, Canada again is higher than any other country, so they clearly have an access to problems with regard to waiting for services. Moving on to quality, this is called mortality amenable to health care. And I'm more interested in the darker red dot. So these are things that you shouldn't have died of if the health care system were doing a good job. Okay? And um, I don't love, love the, the statistic because it's so hard to ferret out what the healthcare system could prevent and not prevent it. For example, they count half of the cardiac deaths. I mean, or half the responsibility of the medical care system. It's kind of a matter of opinion. But anyway, you know, why don't we just take it at face value? This shows what a healthcare system should have prevented. The U.S. has the worst data by far, more mortality amenable to healthcare than any of the other countries. Uh, why? Well, just I think it's mainly because we have such great access problems in this country. Um, Ten years before, if you look at the pink dots, uh, the UK was higher, but they improved a lot more quickly than we've improved, so now we're by far the highest. Uh, this is the parallel one looking at not access, but quality to, uh, from the Commonwealth Fund study of sicker adults. Taking the wrong medication, medical mistake, incorrect diagnosis, delays in getting test results, or any of the above. These are all self-reported. This is someone saying, this happened to me. It's not factual that it happened to them, but this is what they say happened to them. And what you see here is that there are self-perceived quality problems in all countries, less in the UK and Switzerland than the other ones. The US is not at the very top, it's tied for a second after uh, after uh, after New Zealand. Um, Canada is about the same figure as the U.S. So anyway, there are quality problems everywhere that some countries perform better than others. And the last of these charts that I have for you is the overall ranking of the Commonwealth Fund. So again, what they do is they survey people in country, ask them dozens and dozens of questions, and then also get objective measures of outcomes. And then they rank the countries. And I don't like the top line, I think it's kind of silly, this overall ranking, and just to prove to you why it's so silly, is look at the UK, it's number one. Go, to, go down that column, it's number 10 in healthcare outcomes. So it's sort of an odd concept. Well, they're 10th best in outcomes, but the best overall. So I don't like the overall ranking, but I am interested in the other five elements of it. And what you see, first of all, is the US really does very poorly in most things. Okay, in care process, and at the bottom, pretty much in everything else. But two other countries that do pretty badly are Canada and France. Canada does really surprisingly poorly to me in access at number 10, equity and outcomes at number 9. France, 9, 9, 10, 11, does, well in out, does better in outcomes. So anyway, um, and what countries do well? Well, the UK does well in a lot of things, but not outcomes. Australia does well in a number of things, it's, but it's all over the map. Again, there's just no best healthcare system out there. There. I think it's worth drilling that in. Um, so what I want to do now is just talk to you about some countries and I'm going to have a slide describing the country in a nutshell and then I'll have a slide saying what's good and what's bad really, really quickly. Some of you undoubtedly know more about a particular country than I do and you know we can discuss that during, uh, during Q&A. So I decided just to make it a little bit less tedious to divide the nine countries up into two groups. So I'm going to call them single payer groups and multiple payer groups. Is there one insurer or there are multiple? insurers. And I'll start with the single payer systems. And these systems generally are, fe are funded by tax revenues, okay? While the multiple payer systems generally are funded by payroll contributions. So we always hear about Canada. Canada has a single payer system. There's no Canadian healthcare system. Each province and territory, I think there are 13 of them, have their own system. So it's sort of a misnomer talking about the Canadian system, but they share certain things in common. There's a Single payer means there's only one buyer of things, so that buyer has a lot of bargaining power. Uh, and that's what a single payer does. The province is the only buyer of hospital and physician services. Uh, generally, providers are paid on a fee-for-service basis. Um, there's really comprehensive care in Canada for hospital and physician services. It's free at point of service. However, it has really meager coverage for uh, things like dental and uh, and 
in drugs. It's uh, covered uh, sometimes by the province, but generally you have to buy private insurance for it. You can be using this term voluntary health insurance or VHA, VHI a lot. Basically think of that as like Medigap. That's the closest equivalent in the US. And every single country has voluntary health insurance, just some countries use it more than others. So Canada has been able to keep its costs down pretty well because it uses the single payer to negotiate really low fees. And um, if you think that we use mm, certain technologies too much, Canadian provinces have good control over that. They've regionalized the provision, the access to these technologies, so like not every hospital does everything. Uh, problems, Canada has long waits, and as I showed you in the Commonwealth slide, uh, some, some very poor outcomes and uh, in equity outcomes as well. So the second single payer type system you probably heard the most about is the UK, which is uh, really quite different. It, the, on Canada, the hospitals and doctors are like private. In the, in the UK, uh, hospitals are owned by the government. Most doctors are salaried by the government. They don't rely as much on fee for service. What they do is they capitate groups of primary care doctors, and then these primary care groups commission Basically, they do the referrals, putting the patients to specialists and to hospitals. So actually, the primary care docs are more powerful in the UK than in most other countries. Um, very comprehensive coverage, a strong philosophy of health equity. Um, one thing you probably, many of you have heard about is a group called NICE. NICE is the National Institute of, of Care Effectiveness. It's a group, that it's a government body that decides whether services are going to be covered or not. And if the service is too expensive, for what the service provides, it costs too much for something called quality adjusted life year. It isn't provided by the NHS. It's kind of a note known for that. Um, good things, uh, equitable, low out-of-pocket costs, comprehensive benefits, concerns. Some of the outcomes are of concern. Uh, they're 10th to 11 countries in a mor minimal mortality. Of my 11 countries, they're last in breast cancer five-year survival rate. There are some outcome issues in, in the UK. Sweden's like the UK, but it's way more decentralized. It's done on a regional rather than a national basis. They also have a strong history of solidarity and equity, making things fair to the, uh, those who are most disadvantaged. They control costs pretty well because unlike the US, and most, most countries have budgetary limits, and Sweden has budgetary limits that applies on a regional basis. Has very good outcomes with regard to equity uh, and, and, out, and healthcare outcomes as well. Um, their weights for services, and I'm sort of grasping at straws here for another concern, but uh, they have poor coverage for adult dental care, and unlike some other countries. My last single payer country is weird, weird calling it single payer, because private insurance is pretty important. It's Australia. So in Australia is a single payer, but they have a mix of public and private hospitals. And what the government does to try to stay within budget is it gives really strong incentives to buy voluntary health insurance. It gives carrots and sticks to do it. And the idea is that people buy voluntary health insurance, then they can go in the private hospitals instead of the public hospitals, or they can go in private wards of public hospitals and uh, their advantages that they get. They might get uh, more attention from surgeons, faster access to service. Uh, also doctors can charge them extra and this voluntary health insurance will pay for it. So it's a little too teary for, uh, for my blood but that's the way they do it there. Um, outcomes, health outcomes are very good in Australia. Um, but the wealthier people tend to be the ones who own this extra insurance, and I think that causes equity problems. You'll see this showing up in my data slides later. And I'll just mention one other concern that I don't mention elsewhere. There are huge disparities in the Aboriginal health compared to the rest of the Australians. Uh, ten, uh, ten year difference in life expectancy. Government's put a lot of attention into this issue, has not been able to solve it at all. So here are my multiple payer systems. I'm going to start with the one that's different than the others, which is France. France is unlike the other ones because there are lots of insurers, but you don't get to choose. It's kind of chosen for you. Um, 
also unlike the other countries I'm going to talk about next, there's a strong role of government. The government's involved in budgeting and setting provider fees. So it smells almost a little bit like single payer, but it's not single payer. Um, if you look at the French benefit package, it looks really meager. You have to pay like 30% or more for everything, but almost everybody has voluntary health insurance and people with chronic diseases are exempted from cost sharing. Oh, by the way, in most countries, kids don't have to pay cost sharing. That's not true in the United States. Most other countries, they don't. Uh, France has the lowest out-of-pocket costs among all the countries, I think because so many people have this voluntary health insurance. And you're going to see of the, all of my odd results is France. They have really big access problems in spite of really low out-of-pocket costs, and we'll get into that later. Successes, the lowest um, more amenable mortality rate in the world. Uh, concerns. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that uh, access is problematic in France is people have to pay when they get the service. Okay? The insurer doesn't pay directly, and that means people who have liquidity issues have trouble getting services. So that's one issue. And I'm just throwing in something else I want to talk about later. Compared to the other countries, it has very low use of generic drugs. U.S. is a leader, by the way, in that regard in terms of use of generic drugs. Germany is a system that's talked about. The New York Times is always having something about Germany. Uh, it's the first health insurance system in the world, as many of you know, dating back to uh, Bismarck in the 1880s always had a very solid ethic of, uh, uh, ethic of solidarity, um, you know, teach according to, to, to needs um, and from each according to their ability to pay. Um, it's different than France because the government pretty much butts out. What you have are these social groups, you have societal groups, you have groups of insurers, and you have groups of providers, and they negotiate with each other on important things like fees, and uh, they seem to do a pretty good job of it without the government being involved. Germany has something called an all-payer system, and it's important as you watch the debate in the U.S. going forward that you know what an all-payer system is. An all-payer system allows for multiple insurers, but each insurer pays doctors and drug companies and hospitals the same amount. So if I belong to Aetna and you belong to Kaiser, each, uh, I would be worth the, uh, the same, the same, the, the, the same, the same, well, let me, let me, let me, let me put it a, a different way. That um, if, Kaiser's a bad example because they have their own uh, doctors. But if you belong to one insurance company and someone else belongs to another insurance company, you're worth just as much to the hospital. They're not going to favor you. This is unlike our Medicaid program where Medicaid beneficiaries are worth way less to doctors and hospitals than others. And Germany has an all-payer system. Everyone's worth the same amount. They, and they have this, the other unusual thing, and I'll come back to at the very end, is they have a private insurance system for 11% of the population. So they have two tiers, but I'm going to show you later, it doesn't seem to be causing equity problems. Uh, successes, they have comprehensive coverage, little cost sharing, good financial access, very little waiting for services, maybe the lowest in the world. Uh, concerns, you know, there could be concern about this two-tier thing. Uh, they also don't do well on certain, on certain health care outcomes as opposed to access outcomes. Uh, getting near the end of my countries here, we've got Switzerland. So Switzerland is a country where insurance companies really compete with each other to get your business, but they're non-profit insurance companies, unlike in the U.S., and maybe that makes a difference. It's very decentralized. It's done on the state or canton basis. What's unusual about Switzerland is really, really, really high out-of-pocket costs, way higher than even the United States. But people don't go broke in Switzerland because there are maximums on how much you can pay per year. But it may have uh, equity implications. Um, when people look at European healthcare systems, and there's an amusing uh, poll among experts in the New York Times last year, sometimes Switzerland gets voted to be like the best in the world or the best in Europe. I'm not buying because I think the out-of-pocket costs cause too many problems, but it's considered to be a really successful healthcare system. But you can see my concern about out-of-pocket costs. Also, it's a really expensive system. It's the second most expensive system in the world after the United States. Um, the Netherlands. So the Netherlands 
is the country most like the U.S.? In fact, if you were described the Netherlands healthcare system, you would say, oh, those are the Affordable Care Act exchanges or marketplaces. They look exactly alike to each other. Uh, what the Netherlands does relies on private insurance companies competing against each other to control costs and to improve quality, but it's different than the U.S. and there's universal coverage, there's mandated low cost sharing, and there's very comprehensive coverage. So it's a much richer benefits package. Um, it show, you know, I've been, I've been skeptical, you wouldn't know, but I've been skeptical my whole career about whether competition can really uh, work in healthcare. And in some ways, the Netherlands shows that it can work pretty well in terms of at least not jeopardizing access. Where it, <coughs> excuse me, isn't working, in the same way it isn't working, in my opinion, in the U.S., it's not doing a very good job controlling costs. It turns out a single payer does a better job controlling costs than a bunch of competing insurance companies. So that's at least a conclusion I've reached. Maybe all payers can do just as well as the single payer, but many competing insurance companies means that no insurance company has a lot of market power in their negotiations with providers. Finally, then the U.S. Uh, you know about the U.S. We're a mix of tax base, employer based coverage. We don't have universal coverage. We pay a lot out of pocket. Lots of organizational innovations. We invented HMO. We're the ones who move care out of the hospital to the outpatient setting. Um, we don't have budgets here, really, at least certainly outside of. Uh, outside of uh, of uh, public programs. And if I were to, in one concept, try to differentiate the U.S. from other countries, I'd say we ration on the basis of demand rather than supply. If you have really comprehensive insurance, you don't have to pay very much, you can get the service in the U.S. Nothing is going to prevent you from, it's always available because the government is not cutting down on the availability of the services. If you're uninsured, that's not the case. If you're insured, you have a huge deductible, that's not the case. But if you have really comprehensive insurance, pretty much the is the limit in terms of what you get. We don't have outward bo body saying you can't get this, you can't have that. There are successes. I've already mentioned our organizational innovation and flexibility is in that, in that respect the envy of the world. We do, and I've already mentioned some good outcomes like cancer care. Um, I feel sheepish in only listing, to, listing two concerns, but uh, I didn't want to discriminate against the U.S. I didn't list more than two or any other country, so I'll list two. We don't have universal coverage, and we have crazy high unit prices for almost everything. So the last, um, the last part of my remarks is a study that I'm working on right now to try to figure out what characteristics of healthcare systems promote health equity. Again, equity is not everything. We care about two things really, value, which is sort of quality compared to costs, and equity. So I'm just going to be talking about equity, but in Q&A we can talk about other things uh, as well. So I'm going to use the same nine countries, and I've got four international data sources, not just the Commonwealth Fund, but uh, I've got the World Bank and a couple of European sources of data as well. And as I said before, I want to focus on things where the healthcare system, you can blame the healthcare system if things aren't looking good, okay? And that's mainly financial access. I also look at some outcomes as well. Like for example, if there's a lot of asthma deaths, I mean you can blame the healthcare system on that. You know that, 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 that those should be saved. But I'm um, not finding as many findings with regard to that. One of the reasons I focus also on the uh, financial acts or on the outcomes is I'm able to compare poor people to wealthier people. And to me, that's the essence of equity. How do the poor compare to the wealthier people? So that's what I'm going to focus on in the slides that I show you. And um, so I've got 22 measures. I'm going to show you five, okay? Five most interesting. So we've got um, the, the blue bars are people below average income, the green bars are people above average income. I wish I had quintiles, the top 20 and bottom 20%, I only have that on one slide because the data aren't collected that way. But there are a few things to see. So this is having any cost related problem, actually this is to seeing a doctor, I didn't put that in title. So what countries do badly? Well the U.S. does the worst, okay? 
This is 44% um, of people said they had a cost-related access problem in seeing a doctor uh, of, of the below average income people. But even people with income above average, 26%. So the U.S. was clearly the worst in terms of access to seeing a doctor uh, due to costs. But what other countries did badly? Well, Switzerland, remember all those high out-of-pocket costs? They do badly. They also have a big differential between richer and poor. Canada does the third worst. And Australia and France don't do so good either. So there are actually five countries that do pretty badly. There are four countries that do well. Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. I'm not going to make you memorize these because I'm going to try in the last slides to kind of put together the findings so they make sense. Here's uh, having serious problems paying or unable to pay a medical bill. And the US does badly here, Switzerland does badly, but France does the worst. 41% of below average income French say they have trouble paying a bill. Again, I think this is because they have to pay up front. But it's kind of a shocking statistic for a country that has such low out-of-pocket costs. Skip dental care or checkup because of costs in the last year. This is the same results as the first of these slides, except we add Sweden, because Sweden doesn't cover dental care. So we see real problems in Australia, Canada, France, Sweden, Switzerland, and the US. The two worst are Canada and US and Canada in terms of the highest, both the highest figures and the highest differential by income spent more than 10% of income out of pocket by income. I was stunned when I saw this slide because I thought the U.S. would be at the top and it was at the median. So uh, this is again, oh, oh here, this is, is this the slide? Yeah, this is the slide I like because we're looking at income quintiles. So the top 20% versus the bottom 20%. And um, Switzerland has the biggest problem. Australia has a huge differential between the uh, top quintile and bottom quintile. So does Canada. The U.S. actually comes in fourth place, I think, in all these things, and the differential isn't as big as some of the other countries. So I was really surprised to see that, according to the World Bank health statistics, that catastrophic costs uh, happen more often in Switzerland, Canada, and Australia than in the United States. So you learn something every day. Um, and my last of these is I wanted to show you waiting lists by, uh, by below average versus above average income. And a couple interesting things here. One is that like Canada, we've already seen as high waiting lists, there's no difference by income. Everybody's waiting. Well, not everybody's waiting, but you know, there's no, <laughs> everybody isn't waiting. But those who wait, there's not a differential by income. The UK numbers are completely bizarre. 30% of the higher income people say they've had to wait more than two months. Half that many of the lower income people say they've had to wait that month. You can tell me why they answer it that way. France has the same pattern, but at a much lower at magnitude. The one that I find concerning is Australia, and I'll even re return to this at the very end, where twice as many low income people say they have to wait than above income people. So how do we relate all of this? Well. First, so these are my, putting all this together, what do I learn? First thing I learn is that universal coverage matters. We have the worst equity. We have the only country that doesn't uh, provide universal coverage. Second, high cost sharing matters. I've been complaining about Switzerland's high uh, out-of-pocket costs. It shows up in the data. They have a lot of problems with regard to equity. Australia and the U.S. also have high out-of-pocket costs, and they also uh, have equity problems. Canada doesn't have as high out-of-pocket costs, but it has equity problems for some of the pre next uh, slides, uh, bullet points I'll show you. And that has to do with the benefits package. Germany and the UK have very comprehensive benefits package. They cover drugs, they cover dental. Uh, other things that often aren't covered are things like vision, physical therapy, things like that, but I'm focusing on drugs and dental, which are the big ticket items. Um, and uh, there are big gaps in the other countries. Canada does so poorly because beyond hospital and physicians, the provinces really don't cover hardly anything. And we have similar things in other countries, including the U.S. The benefits package is, and it's not just cost sharing, it's what is covered matters. And 
I didn't want to leave you hanging in voluntary health insurance. Voluntary health insurance matters. If you are in a country where you've got to supplement, there tend to be more equity problems, okay? Because wealthier people are the ones who tend to be able to supplement. And so this is true. I list a bunch of countries uh, which had access problems and they rely on voluntary health insurance. The concept of VHI doesn't really apply to the U.S. It's all sort of voluntary here. Um, and also in Australia, where we saw that poor people waited longer, voluntary health insurance essentially allows you to jump the queue. One hears about this happening in Britain too, but I think it's much less widespread uh, than, in, uh, than in Australia. Ooh. Here we go. Just, I think I want two more slides. So this one, some other findings. So Germany, one worries about because 11% of the people are not part of the universal scheme, but it doesn't seem to have a problem with equity. And I think it's because of two things. One is it's not just richer people who opt out, it's also civil servants and the self-employed. So even more of a mix of the population. And also at 11%, it's not that widespread. 89% of the people in the main system, so they probably have a whole lot of political clout making sure that the main system works pretty well. France is just bizarre. Uh, the lowest out-of-pocket spending, but 26% of the lower half of the people had cost-related access problems to doctors, 41% had problems skip paying medical bills, a third reported skipping dental care, tenfold differences in unreported unmet dental needs by income quintile, more catastrophic spending than you would have thought, and I didn't show you this one, but the the different, when you ask people, how do you like your doctor? The biggest difference by income is in France, uh, where the uh, poor people are much less happy with their experience with the doctor than the wealthier people. Um, why does this happen? I th why is all this happening? Well, I think it's for a few reasons. Mainly people have to pay directly for care. France has tried to change this, and then the doctor, whenever it's brought up, the doctors go on strike. The doctors like being paid directly by the, by the patients. I think that's probably also why generic drug use is so low, because the doctors like to assign brand names, but I have not researched that thoroughly. Um, half the population poor is being billed above the national amount, balance billing or extra billing. And 10% poorest people get voluntary health insurance, but doctors can't extra bill them, and so they might not treat these patients as well, and the poor people seem to be kind of unhappy. So, my last slide, very simple. Uh, this is not my sum up, it's just a last thought I have. Spending doesn't buy more equity. So the two countries that spend the most are the US and Switzerland. The two countries with the biggest equity problems, or two of the three, along with Canada, are the US and Switzerland. And if you spend less, that doesn't necessarily cause equity problems. Actually, the UK has low spending, but it has few equity problems. So anyway, you've now had enough data thrown at you, so we'll end it right there. Thank you very much. We'll take some questions now. I'll start back there and then come over here. Alan? Thank you, Thank you I, I want to go back to your first slide where you showed the enormous differential in cost in the United States versus every other country. Sure. Where does the money go? We still, we always seem to rank 10th or 11th amongst the group of nations, but we spend almost twice as much, I guess, per capita. Yeah. Where does the money go? And how much worse would those charts look if we uh, 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 adjusted them for in, in, uh, spending? You know, you can adjust in the way, and the charts look that much worse. You're exactly right. If you look at sort of like spending versus outcomes, we have the highest spendings, we don't do so well in the outcomes. So I could show you, if you emailed me, I could show you some really dramatic charts of how that even look much more, look much worse than uh, this. Where does the money go? So that's been talked about a lot. 
is if you had to pick one thing, and I think I listed on my slide, is we have way higher prices. So what does that mean, having way higher prices? It means we're paying a lot more for a hospital stay. Hospitals are getting more money. What are they doing with the money? They're doing a lot of very expensive technical things with the money. They're using very expensive equipment uh, and so on. They're also paying, even though you might not think of a nurse as rich, uh, you we're also paying our healthcare workers more than others. We're paying our doctors more than others. So part of it is going towards us sal towards salary. Part of it clearly is going towards administrative costs. The U.S. has higher administrative costs by far than any other country. That's part of what's going on. Go what's going on there? One place that's not going to int interestingly is malpractice. So people think that the U.S. has spent so much money on malpractice. Uh, insurance, actually only one third of one percent of U.S. costs are for malpractice uh, premiums. Now there may be some defensive medicine going on that's more important than that, but it's not going towards malpractice. So I mean that, I'm trying to think what other things that I can, oh sure I can add one more thing, thing to that. So in terms of use of services, we get less, we go to the hospital less, we stay shorter periods, and we go to the doctor less. What do we do more? Well, we do get more high techy procedures, but it's not dramatically more. The rest of the uh, high income world is catching up with us. The country that has the most of the fancy equipment and gets the most procedures is Japan. Japan is in my larger study. I did not include it here because I can't get the data comparing the poorer and the wealthier people in Japan. But, uh, but we do get more fancy, expensive stuff, and that's reflected in these high unit prices. So how, then you ask, why is it that we're paying these, these high prices? Well, providers seem to have an awful lot of bargaining power. Pharmaceutical companies have a lot of bargaining power, and we haven't um, used the, uh, what I call the monopsonistic power of government to try to cut the fees. For example, part of Part D of Medicare law, you know, Part D of the drug benefit says that we cannot use, we can't use Medicare to negotiate fees. So I think fees have a lot to do with it. You um, frequently hear criticisms of proposed a single payer and uh, and or Medicare for all as being cost prohibitive. By that I mean you hear people saying that it would cost thirty-two trillion dollars a year mm -hmm. or three hundred and twenty trillion trillion over a ten year period. Mm -hmm. Have you or anyone you know of considered what we're actually paying now as a society for lesser benefits such as how much are we paying in premiums um, for health insurance, whether it's employer paid or individual uh, Medicare premiums, government payment for uninsured people, um, emergency room care and the like, and if so, how does it compare? Because what we're talking about is total societal cost. Yeah. Well, I mean, we already know how much we're paying. You know, it's sort of redundancy because that's how much we're paying is how much we're paying. So the question is, how much less would we be paying if we had a single payer system? And lots of people have looked at that. Lots of people are looking at that currently right now. Um, there's no question in my mind that a single payer system would cost less because administrative costs would be considerably lower in a single payer system. Uh, everybody's covered. You have, you have everybody's covered, so you don't have to have this uh, safety net. Uh, you don't have all these costs of administering insurance. So certainly it would be cheaper. I think one of the questions um, th that's less clear is uh, for the first gentleman's question was, uh, wh why are we spending so much more? 
more? And I said, well, probably the main thing is that we have higher unit prices. So one of the mysteries is if we had a single payer system, would our prices go down very much? And that's something I just don't have an answer to because it's a political question. It has to do with if we enacted a political a single payer system, would we be able to have rates that are way lower than they are now? Or to pass such legislation, would we have to appease interest groups to get them to, uh, to, to, to support it? I mean, if you look at what happened in passing Medicare in 1965, what we did is that, you know, remember it was called socialized medicine by the doctor, by the AMA, and they didn't want it. And basically, we handed, it, we handed the, the, the safe over to them and let them have the money. We didn't, we said, we're not going to take any money away from you. We're going to let you basically charge whatever you want. Costs actually went way up and doctors and hospitals ended up really loving Medicare. So I think it just depends on the politics of it, but I'm concerned that, uh, that the prices that you see in a country like Canada politically would not um, get enacted uh, in, in, the United, in the United States. And there's one other, one other point I want to make. There's um, a real, real big concern about the transition to single payer. And let me be very clear what I mean by that. So right now, health care for the people who have private insurance is paid by employers and employees, okay? The amount paid by employers is not taxable to the employee. So let's suppose that we um, have a single payer system and it's taxed finance. It would take fewer dollars because of these administrative costs that I'm talking about. But what you'd have to do then is increase taxes. Where does the money come from? Well, all that money and then some would come from higher wages, right? Because employers are no longer paying for it, so you should get higher wages. And economic theory makes it very clear that if an employer is not paying, uh, paying these benefits, you'll get the money in wages. But just because economic theory says says that does not mean you will get the population to believe that if their taxes will go up, their wages will go up even more. And that's a, a very, very challenging political problem to convince people that they can actually afford to pay those taxes because they think of that, oh, higher taxes. They don't think, oh, higher taxes is being made up for by an even higher income. <laughs> Thank you. Taking your point about um, higher prices being... Taking your point that higher prices are one of the reasons that, costs, that uh, our costs are so high, if there was a single-payer system, wouldn't we be dropping out a lot of costs that are in the system today? Talking not only lower administrative costs, the salaries that the execs get from the high-end companies. Uh, President of Cedars, for example, makes a million and a half dollars a year in one hospital uh, in one city. Um, Promotional costs, things like that. Yeah. Those would those would drop out of the system. And I have a second question, if you can. Uh, if sure, I, I, think I, I, I will ask that again if I forget it. Go oh, ahead. I want to ask one. <laughs> okay, and, and the other one is: Can you comment on utilization, our utilization uh, data, as compared to the other countries yeah. you've talked about, and, and, and why that seems to be in line or out of line? Uh, if you can. Sure. Uh, so the first one, I totally, I, I, I love the idea of a system that would have fewer administrative costs, and there's no question in my mind that uh, you would see that in terms of, I mean, if you look at the cost of administration, you want to go beyond that, but I mean, you know, high salaries of uh, executive insurance companies, that's part of the administration. Those costs would go down. You know, in terms of the compensation for like somebody at Cedars, I don't know. I mean, they're making less money than a whole bunch of doctors at UCLA. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, Cedars is still going to want to have a fancy CEO in order to be able to, you know, provide the vision to compete against the other healthcare systems in LA. Uh, so I mean, I, I buy in the that there would be substantially lower administrative costs, and I'm open to the idea that fees would be lower. But politically, I just don't know. Now, your second question was. Did you just want me to talk more about differences in utilization? Yeah. If you could, 
Yeah, sure. So if you, I, I don't, didn't bring the data with me, but I mean, if you look at the number of doctor visits in the United States, we, you know, average about four a year. Most of the Western European countries, it's higher than that. You know, it's like six or seven a year. Japan, it's like 15 a year, but that's because Japanese historically go back to their doctor in order to refill a prescription. Why do they have that crazy system? Because the fees are so low in Japan, the way doctors make money is having the patients come back and refill their prescriptions. And they're beginning to, they're beginning to change that. And it seems to have somehow worked for the Japanese. Um, but we have, we, we have, uh, it, we do not have the lowest physician use among high income countries, but we're among the lowest, okay? In terms of the hospital, we are among the lowest both in going to the hospital and we're among the lowest in how long we stay in the hospital. Um, so that, that, that's all that, I, that I, I meant there. We do do more, you know, if you look at like bypass operations, there are more here than in other countries. You MRIs, there are more, but there aren't way more. They're just kind of somewhat more because other countries are catching up. I wanted to ask, uh, you pointed out that we need to look at incremental gains rather than huge gains. I wondered if you had some advice, especially to politicians who were making proposals of where an incremental uh, gain you think might be politically possible in this country. Well, I mean, nothing's politically possible right this second, okay? <laughs> so, I, so we have to take the medium term rather than the, and I'm being a little glib here because there, maybe there is something, but in healthcare it's hard to really come up with what it is, but we can take a medium term here and say, you know, after after the next election, uh, let, let, let's view that. So here, I mean, I've been trying, up till now I've been giving research opinions, I haven't been giving you my political opinions, uh, my personal opinions, but you kind of asked for it. Uh, I would say that the main incremental changes that we could be making at this point would be to bolster access to care. And so, you know, this is the, the way this is talked about, so Democrats in Congress is improving on the Obamacare. And so what, you know, what I would like to see is I would like to see the Medicaid expansions back in all states. Um, uh, why? Because I believe that we should be giving health access to health care for people above 138% of the poverty level. So the first thing I'd want to do is that I think I would like to see higher subsidies for purchasing coverage on the exchanges because right now a lot of people have to buy plans that have deductibles of $6,000. The, the, the bronze plans, well having a deductible of $6,000 is like being uninsured if you're a young person who knows that they're not going to reach that deductible. So I think I would say shoring up, uh, shoring up the benefits package under the ACA would be, uh, would be one area where I would, uh, I would like to see us go. You know, I think that there are areas in, Mer in Medicare that we should be looking at as well. I mean, finally, the donut hole is, uh, is going to go away by, I think, 2020. That's good. Medicare, I don't want to hurt your feelings here, but Medicare is a horrible benefits package. Here's why it's a horrible benefit package. It's because there's no maximum on your out-of-pocket costs. Employer coverage, there's a maximum what you pay. Under Obamacare, there's a maximum. Under Medicare, there isn't. So you are at tremendous financial risk under Medicare unless you buy supplemental coverage. Most of you on Medicare probably are doing that through Medicare Advantage plan because Medicare Advantage rates very high in Southern California. But if you're doing it through Medicare fee-for-service, then you need to get a Medigap policy. You need to buy a Part D, a Part D drug coverage. Um, if Medicare were to put a cap on out-of-pocket spending per year, that would be a really good way to not force a lot of the population to have to buy Medigap policies. So that would be my prescription with regard to something incremental we could do in the area of Medicare. Uh, okay. Have you got the, uh, the equivalent chart for Medicare if you use the, uh, um, you know, United Care to, to, to uh, cover the 20%? I, I didn't quite know. So, so are you talking about Medicare Advantage plans where on your Medicare you could get a private insurer to give your benefits? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Have, have, you, have you done those kind of, have you done those kind of charts for that? Where you have Medicare plus 20% covered by a, a, 
So, so tell me more about what sort of a chart you'd be, would you want to be comparing Medicare Advantage to traditional Medicare? I'm not exactly sure what you want to compare. Well, I'd want to compare it to, to all the other uh, uh, countries you had on the charts. Yeah. Gosh, that's a really hard question to, uh, to answer in part because I don't think anyone's really done a, a study quite like that. Let me think for a second about the, about the, medic, the benefits package. You know, most of the Medicare Advantage benefit packages are pretty good. They, you know, they, co they cover prescription drugs. You know, they generally don't cover dental care, but that's just not something that... The Kaiser Family Foundation this week came out on a report on a dental care for Medicare beneficiaries. It's worth Googling if you're interested in. They found that two-thirds of Medicare beneficiaries did not have dental coverage. So um, so I'd say that, it, 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 that Medicare Advantage does pretty well with regard to drugs, does pretty well with regard to co-pays, doesn't do so well compared to dental. But without having had time to really, really um, mull about your question. I think the benefit package in most Medicare Advantage plans is probably fairly comparable to uh, to those in, 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 other, in, in other countries. Uh, most of them do not have very big deductibles, for example, except perhaps under, under Part D. That's even, not, even, that, even that big deductible. Yeah, so I'm buying that the benefit package for Medicare Advantage might be comparable from other countries, but don't hold me to it. Uh, did, did you compare? Did, did you compare the the transparency of the fees in other countries versus ours? I mean, this whole issue of the sticker price being X and the actually paid being a fifth of that, and that that whole uh, unexpected outcome of of every transaction. We are uh, we are exceptional in America. You go to another country and they just list the prices in the doctor's office. Um, you know, there aren't out-of-network services. Uh, there are not special, there's, a, there's a generally a single fee, so there aren't special deals cut between the insurers and the, uh, and the, uh, and the providers. I, I haven't exactly done research on this, but I've read Elizabeth Rosenthal's book. She was a, report, a physician and reporter for the New York Times. Now she's kind of off on her own. She wrote a book about, basically, if you have a horror story about billing, you send it to her. And she wrote a book about it about two years ago, and it's a really interesting book. And then she, has, she, she writes about this continuously. There's no other country that does it the way we do. Uh, Recently, the Trump administration made hospitals re release something called the Charge Master, which was all of the prices for all the services. It is completely incomprehensible. Trump administration wants to go farther and say that there cannot be secret deals between like drug companies and, uh, and, and, and insurers. That hasn't happened yet. I'm not sure that it will happen. Uh, you know, I, I one of the problems with incremental reform is I'm not sure how we're going to solve that problem. I mean, you probably do need something really, really fundamental to solve that problem. It is so ingrained in the U.S. system, these separate prices that every, pay, every payer has with every provider. It's a, it's a really excellent point. Uh, thank you very much for all your, your comments, but I wanted to ask, when we're talking about price, about cost, something that wasn't mentioned is what I believe is a very high price that doctors charge in this country. Mm -hmm. And I believe the reason for it is the cost of medical school. And I know in other countries where doctors' fees are less, both university and medical school is paid for by the government. There's no tuition charges, and that has to be reflected in what the doctors are charging and what they're satisfied in getting. Could you comment about that, sure. please? I think that's probably true with regard to primary care. So one, uh, you don't see these studies but about every decade or so, but the last time I saw a study looking at rate of return on training, okay, uh, and it compared like 
it compared specialty medicine, primary care medicine, being a lawyer, being a doctor, going to business school. What they find is that actually the worst of those five professions in terms of rate of return on training is becoming a primary care doctor. Because it takes so long to get it and your income isn't all that high. Specialty medicine actually was, was pretty good. It was comparable becoming, I didn't mention becoming a dent, I didn't mention a dentist, becoming a dentist or becoming a lawyer, or becoming a becoming a, a businessman. So I think that probably you're right. I mean, even with the fees we're seeing for primary care, really it's not even paying for that great of rate of return for a primary care uh, for primary care doctors. Uh, it may be that you have to get other explanations for specialist salary because they seem to reflect more than a normal rate of return. So there's something, specialists have certain extra power compared to primary care doctors and uh, if you want to chat afterwards I can talk to you about the RUC, the Resource Utilization Committee of the American Medical Association. They're the one that recommends to the government what, how the Medicare fee schedule should change and the specialists completely control the society and they seem to be able to get much higher fees. We have a question back here and then maybe one more. Uh, if you... Excuse Sorry. Well, let's do this one first and then we'll do this one. Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh he said Go ahead. We have a wide variety of medical care in the United States. And um, I'm sure the range and the costs go from one end to another. Have you done anything specifically looking at, and I know a number of us are Kaiser members and former Kaiser doctors, how does Kaiser compare on the, comp the various factors that you were um, listing and have you been able to study that or look at that or other organizations yeah. that are providing a different type of care than's been traditional in the United States? Thanks. Read about a lot, a lot about it. I don't, wouldn't say that I've studied it. It's hard to even know where to start. Kaiser, let's just talk about Kaiser for a minute. Let's look, take Consumer Reports. You know, Consumer Reports is always rating uh, health plans. Kaiser always comes up on top. You go to the state of California, Office of the Consumer Advocate. You look at their ratings of uh, health plans. Kaiser always goes comes up on top. So it seems to be providing good care. Uh, I'm at UCLA, but I'm a Kaiser member. I think very highly of Kaiser. Um, if you Look at Kaiser spending. Kaiser spending is lower than other places, but you know, it has to compete to buy doctors. I think that one thing Kaiser is good at doing is not over utilizing, uh, over -utilize, or utilizing the, the, the staff that they have well. If the entire, you know, we hear about a doctor shortage now in the United States. If everybody was able to use its staff the way that Kaiser uses its staff, I don't think we would have a Kaiser, a, a, a doctor shortage in Kaiser. I think Kaiser does a very good job. Here's the problem. People have in the United States have not shown themselves to want to be in a group or staff model HMO. And so it's common in California, pretty much isn't common anywhere else. I like it, I'm in it. I was born into an HMO way before the term HMO had even uh, come up in something called the Group Health, Associ group Health Association in Washington, D.C. And uh, so I've always been a fan of them. Most people aren't. And in fact, if you look at enrollment in just HMOs in general, not just Kaiser HMOs, but you know, Aetna type HMOs versus PPOs over time, what you're seeing is real plummeting enrollment in HMOs in tremendous growth in enrollment in PPOs. You know, people are showing what they want by what they enroll in and people seem to be wanting to be in the PPOs. So, um, as much as I think the Kaiser model is successful, and about 10 or 15 years ago, there's this article in, uh, I think it was in Lancet, that compared uh, Kaiser to the National Health Service, and Kaiser came out much better, and England was aghast. Uh, 
I, I really like the Kaiser model, and it's not for everyone. And many of you know about Atoll Gawande's article in the New Yorker several years ago comparing uh, McAllen and El Paso, Texas. And he talked about other models besides Kaiser that were really successful, like the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic. There, you know, there are some real best practices out there, and I don't think that that's the norm. And I think, unfortunately, most people have chosen that that isn't the sort of place they want to be in. You know, the doctors in Mayo, they have to self-select wanting to be salaried, and also maybe most doctors don't want that either. One more question from Paul. Yeah. Uh, if you ignore what's politically feasible, what would you recommend for the United States? Yeah. So, I, I, I was sort of hoping that that didn't come up, so... <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I, I think my, my opinion isn't any better than anyone else's opinion who studied this, and there are thousands and thousands of people who study these issues closely in the United States. I, I, I've always liked the idea of the all-payer systems. The all-payer system is say, we have insurance companies, but we tell the insurance companies how much they're going to pay. And how do we come up with that fee? Well, some people are proposing the Medicare fee. Some people are saying that's too low to be politically feasible, but maybe something above the Medicare fee. That way a Medicaid person would be worth as much as a Blue Cross person. It would cut down tremendously on administrative expenses. Uh, there would be not be nearly the same problems with regard to access to care. I think there'd be an ability to control costs. The problem is that moving in, I, I, I'll tell you, a, uh, a boring personal story, which is that I was on a family vacation and like in car in a car, we had little kids at the time, it was like around 1993, and Clinton was going to go on the radio and announce the plan he was going to propose. And I sort of, you know, had my fingers crossed saying, be all payer, be all payer. And it wasn't. It was regulated competition. And uh, that wasn't the model that I was looking, looking for. I can understand why you do that politically going back to the first question about single payer, I don't know how you're going to get from here to there. I just do know that a system with multiple payers like Germany has, which has all payer system, it would be easier to, well, I don't know this, I feel that it would be easier to get to than going all the way to sort of the Canadian style model. So I like that model, but I don't for a moment believe, to believe that there's any political fe feasibility to it, but it doesn't look as weird. We would still have our private insurers. Germany, people are choosing their insurers insurers, just like in the U.S. It's just the fees the German insurers pay are all standard no matter. Each insurer pays the same fee to the doctor and the hospital. So anyway, all right. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much, Professor Rice. Our, uh, that was wonderful. And uh, now people have some actual information.